Hi, my name is Mia Bella Bricky. I was born and raised in Salt Lake City, Utah. I grew up in a small family. It was just my parents and me and my brother. And I grew up right in the heart of Salt Lake in Sugar House. A small community was pretty much like the definition of my childhood. When I was around 10 years old, I started just being like kind of sick all the time. So I went into the hospital on the 25th of May. And then for months leading up to that, I was just a really sick kid. I was misdiagnosed with salmonella at one point. Another point when I was presenting very sickly, we went to the instant care and they said I just had some random virus. The doctors couldn't be specific. And it got to the point in May where I was laying on the floor of our bathroom and I was throwing up every three minutes. We decided to go to the Instacare. The idea was that I was just gonna get some fluids and go back home, but I just needed to like basically get rehydrated because what was so clear to us that was happening was I had some virus, a flu, like I had been told for the months, right? And so we were like, well, okay, I need some fluids. I should be better, right? So we get there, they, they bring me back and, you know, they're trying to place an IV and they poked me nine different times and they couldn't place one because I was so dehydrated. And when they couldn't get one, they sent me up to the ER and they had a IV team. There are, are like teams of people who specifically put in IVs for people who are have like trickier bodies to put IVs into. The IV team got my IV in on the first try and immediately started just flooding my body with fluids. When you grow up in a small community, like I said, the definition of my childhood was small community. My dad was close friends with a couple of the nurses. When he walked into the ER, he was like, my name is Dr. Bricky. This is what's going on. This is what's wrong with my daughter. So they listened and they took his word and ultimately it ended up setting me back a little bit. When they gave me as many fluids as they did, because just to clarify, when we got to the ER, the thing that was being said was she's super dehydrated. She needs a lot of fluids, but that's it. After she's hydrated, we're leaving. So I'm in the ER, fluids are going, but as they're noticing that my, basically my condition is getting worse. As I receive more and more fluids, I'm not getting better. I'm frankly only getting worse. They're doing all these tests. They're listening to my heart and they're noticing that my heart is not beating normally. It was completely out of control. It was just beating randomly. So they pulled up an echo, which is like a scan where and they looked at my heart and they realized that my heart was barely, barely beating at all. It was barely pushing blood. It was bad. So what they decided they needed to do was basically a small little procedure where they wanted to shock my heart with a wire. It was, they had to put me down, like put me under, but they took a little wire on my carotid artery and they were going to shock, shock the wire with some electricity to see if that would restore the correct electrical rhythm to the heart. So from, from my perspective, I had no idea the uh, panic that everyone else was experiencing. What was really happening outside of my room is like the nurses pulled my dad to the side and said, you need to get your wife here right now. This is not a small thing. The nurses didn't really know how to tell my parents that I was like on death's doormat basically. And that if they weren't able to get my heart to beat normally, then it was gonna be really bad. Still, even then my, my dad wasn't comprehending, but he still called my mom. My mom showed up. I remember my mom gets there. Now I have the both of them there and um, they began the procedure and everything was fine. They completed it. They were able to 
put a wire up my carotid artery, they were able to shock my heart. Although it did give a little bit more force to the beat, it did not create any sort of positive enough outcome. Like the doctors did not feel comfortable enough to unintubate me. But they admitted me into the hospital, kept me intubated, and put me into a room in the ICU. And it was about four hours later. My parents, they say they, they heard a code called out. They look up and there was a nurse standing in the doorway, crying, looking at them. And when my dad made eye contact with the nurse, the nurse just said, you need to come right now. And my dad says that when he came up, he saw this big man like pounding into his little girl's chest and he didn't know how to respond because his instinct was to protect me but he knew his brain was smarter than that right so what ended up happening is my dad just started like jumping up and down and my dad's outside of the room jumping up and down and the nurses are like trying to help him and he's like don't fucking he's like don't touch me i won't get in the way but don't touch me my dad's there jumping panicking my mom's like bawling and i'm laying in bed receiving CPR. Even though they did CPR on me for 65 minutes and I was intubated the whole time, they didn't know if I was brain dead or not because I was not responding and they had me on life support. They ended up putting me on ECMO. My heart wasn't beating, but that was all you could see. Otherwise, I was perfectly healthy. Like they couldn't understand why my heart had stopped and refused to start again. They didn't understand. So because of the, the trauma though, that my body had taken during the, the cardiac arrest, the doctors decided really my only, my only option was a heart transplant. The doctors, they were not confident that I was strong enough to be put from one machine to the other. They basically were like, she has to have a heart transplant by the end of this week and a half <laughs> or else we have to take her off life support and we can try and put her on another life support but we don't want to try because we know it's not going to work and we know she's not strong enough first of all getting me put to the top of the list was a whole thing in itself there was some divine timing when it came to like the moment when the deciding moment when someone was going to decide whether or not i was brain dead and capable and if i was going to basically be qualified to be put on the donor list to be put on um, the unos organ donation list you must be considered a viable recipient and you have to have positive chances of doing well and surviving and thriving post-transplant. So if you're a person who doesn't have a high chance of survival past surgery, they won't even put you on the list because frankly, they don't want to waste organs. So originally the person who assessed me actually marked me as an unviable candidate. The person who was testing me had asked me to open my eyes and squeeze their hand and I didn't do that. And I also failed a number of their other tests. And this was also while I was still under, you know, a lot of medication and basically in a medically induced coma, but I wasn't responding enough. So I was marked as an unviable candidate. And as the person who was assessing me was walking out of the room with that said assessment, my dad ran up to him and was like, wait, please just wait. He, he turned around and he yelled in my ear as I was laying in bed. He, he, my dad goes, Mia, this is your father. You need to open your eyes right now. And he kind of yelled it very forceful. And my dad says that I opened my eyes. I looked at him and I squeezed his hand and then immediately went back to sleep. And my dad says that he watched the man cross out whatever he had written down, write something new and walk out of the room. And about an hour and a half later, they, my parents were told that I had qualified and that they had okayed me to be put on the list. But to transition a little bit, that's kind of like the context of like what got me there, right? So now I'm like, I'm in this coma waiting for a heart transplant. And that's where I had my, my NDE. 
what I remember, and I believe that this was what was going on when my heart went into cardiac arrest, when they started CPR on me. And then for the week and a half that I was on life support, I was in limbo. I was sitting on the edge of a cliff the entire time. I can't tell you where this cliff was. It wasn't anywhere on this planet Earth, but it was beautiful. The cliff was very tall. The best I can compare it to would be like the Cliffs of Moor type vibes, right? And I had my feet hanging over the edge of the cliff. Like my feet were suspended in dead air, midair. But I was sitting on the ground and I remember sitting there for what felt like ages. Time did not exist in this plane. So I was not concerned about time. I was not thinking about it. It was not even a concept. So therefore it was not even something to think about. It was just, the experience was just ever existing. I felt so calm. And I think even to this day, unconsciously, my soul, my spirit, and my body tries to get back to that feeling often. And it's like a state of just, pure wholeness. When I was sitting there on that cliff, I was myself, but I was also the exact same as everything else that was surrounding me. Not just like scientific, like we were made of the same thing, but like I was at the same playing field as the grass that I was sitting on and the air that I was breathing. It was all one. We were all one. It was, it was a connection. It was just like true peace. But I sat there on the edge of that cliff with my feet hanging and I watched what I can only best describe as a sunset, but it wasn't a sunset like you've seen here on earth. What I was watching was a living, breathing ball of energy that was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. It was bright white light but it was colorful, but it wasn't blinding, but it was the brightest thing I've ever seen. It didn't have a face. It was a literal orb of pulsing, breathing, living energy. And below the, the cliff was an ocean. I don't see land. Again, I just see open ocean. And there are beings that are at the bottom of the cliff. They were waiting for me, but not in a way that was like, they were even expecting me. They were just there. And I wish I could explain what they looked like, but I can't. Like, they didn't even have bodies. Like, they were spirits. But they told me that if I wanted to jump off of the cliff, they would catch me. I would be safe. I wouldn't be hurt. There was a big emphasis on, like, if you choose to come with us, you will be a-okay. Like, you will be okay. But there was equal emphasis on, but don't come until you feel ready. And we will wait here and we will not rush you. And we will be here as long as we need to be here. Like there's absolutely no rush. Like there was just as much equal emphasis as for me to stay where exactly where I was as there was for me to go with them. So they told me basically, they were like, if you come with us, we'll take you to the orb. And I remember thinking like, thanks. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll get there eventually. I'm just like chilling right here for now. I'm just gonna like push staying up here a little bit longer cause I'm enjoying being up here too. If I haven't made it clear, like I was just, it's just this cliff behind me was, it, it's just open grass. And it's like, if you can picture like an open field with grass and flowers and some trees here and, just like kind of foresty vibes. And I haven't said this even yet, but behind me, there was a shed. And I did go in the shed and I remember not liking it in there. And so that's why I didn't go back in. It wasn't like scary looking, but it definitely didn't really, it didn't feel like it fit like this heavenly landscape that I was in, right? Like it was like brutal reminder of humanity sitting in this like field of heaven <laughs> of mortality it was like this sinking sounds brutal but there was like an energy around it that felt humanity and like the energy that comes with being a human and having a physical body and being 
physically stuck to certain places, like the actual energy of being a human, it, it felt like that was like orbing around this shed. And when I went in, there were etchings of names on the walls. And it was like sad because there were thousands of names and I don't, and when I say sad, I don't mean like heartbreaking sad. I just mean like a heavy melancholy energy that's like there and it's significant and it's something that you need to recognize because, you know, there's some feelings of loss that were hanging in there and like real, like the feelings that come with being human, you know, being human is brutal. And I remember just like being in there and like being like, I need to get the fuck out of here. I did not like it in there at all. So I left very quickly and spent the rest of my time on the edge of that cliff. And that's where I sat for the whole, literally the entire, my entire experience of being there, which, what, which did feel like forever. When I kind of like put all this together and realized what I was remembering, right? I told my dad, his reaction sort of like solidified my like confidence in my story. He told me about when I was still on life support and they weren't sure if I was even there. They weren't sure if I was brain dead or not. It, it was when things were really bad. There was a woman who is a very powerful witch and energy reader, and she's a psychic witch for sure. But she came and she visited me while I was in the hospital, while I was in my coma. Uh, she's a friend of my parents. She sat there and she like held the bottom of my feet. And when she walked back out, she told my parents, she said that I was sitting, that I was on a, another like plane that I was in another plane that like my brain was okay she was like I was still there that the daughter you know is still there but she's in another plane she's in another world and she's hanging out by a body of water and she feels really calm but she doesn't know whether or not she wants to stay or leave and she needs some like confidence she needs some affirmation she needs to hear that you guys want her to stay to me is just like that one clarification from her really was what made me feel so confident in my story that was my near-death experience. You know, after that woman left and told my parents these things, you know, of course the entire time before that too, they were at my bedside and weren't leaving, but you know, they really stepped it up and they were like, well, we can't even start to even entertain the idea of her not being okay. Like we need to tell her she's okay. Like they started to really push this, like, we need to tell her how much we need her. We need to tell her that she needs to fight. Right. And it's so true. Like, I remember thinking, I don't really know. Like, I don't know if I want to stay. I don't know if I want to go. I like having the option to choose and I'm going to like wait on that. And I remember just that and that that's kind of it. Like that's kind of how it ends. I don't remember how it ended. You know, there's people who tell stories of what it's like to be in a coma. Right. And I, <laughs> I experienced that for sure. I remember thinking I was a baby in a baby's cradle at one point. My brain trying to place my body in space and figure out what was going on, hearing everything around me, but uh, not being able to open my eyes. I literally remember yelling at myself to open my eyes, but not being able to open my eyes. I remember crying and screaming and being so confused and very upset. And then when I was finally able to open my eyes and then hear that I had had a heart transplant and that like my life was completely different and changed forever. My heart transplant was really only the beginning. Like I said, my lungs collapsed twice afterwards. My kidneys failed. Um, I had to relearn how to walk. I had to relearn how to talk and swallow and drink liquids, eat food. I had to relearn how to write. It was really hard for me to even understand how I could like, how what happened to me happened to me. For a long time, I had this like, why me attitude. And then it was when I started re-remembering my NDE that things kind of became okay. Like, I don't know. I wish I could go back to even sitting here, like to just go back and feel that feeling one more time. 
would be the meaning of life. It felt like the meaning of life. And I wish I could go back, but the best I can do is live and try to live through love and acceptance. And in my personal opinion, that's the only way to get as close to that feeling as I can. Because when I live through love, I look at every experience and every situation with love. I look at every person with love, you know, try and understand all sides of every situation, of every person. And when you really do try and hold yourself accountable to that, I do think that you start to see changes in the way that you just experience and think about life.